Hey Health Junkies, it's time for The Health Fix. Join your host doctor, Janine Krause, as she gives you a dose of what you need to know and do right now to take control of your health from the inside out to rebel against aging, look damn good, fight stress, and laugh every day. Hello there, health junkies. Welcome to another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Kraus. Today's episode, we're going to be talking about the common problems that might be interfering with your brain function. So in my office, I've been asked recently by a few patients to do a podcast on brain function as a follow-up to Dr. Mark Hyman's Broken Brain series, things of that nature. So I said, sure, why not? I will give my spin on what I recommend for broken brains and improving brain function, in particular, working on brain fog, memory, and concentration. So let's jump into it. The number one thing that I really see as a huge problem for folks in terms of their memory, their concentration, and their ability to really use their brain to their full potential really comes from being stressed. And while you might not be stressed in the moment, you might be coming off a stressful period of life, or perhaps you're just starting your adventure in the stress world, or you may have a good place right now, you might be in a good place right now, but have a series of stressors, or maybe I might call them traumas, because any way you look at it, series of stressful situations all add up to our brain as trauma, and they all slowly start to chip away at our brain and create brain damage, as I will call it. Now, when we look at stress, stress is... Well, you know, it's a weird thing because a lot of us picture it as not being that big of a deal. A lot of people are like, oh, you know, yeah, I'm stressed, but I'm working through it. No big deal. But we don't really realize how many things we internalize and don't process properly or deal with. Maybe we just kind of stuff it down. Those of you out there who are stress stuffers, meaning you have a situation and you're go-to response is to push it down and just keep plugging through. You guys are the ones I worry about the most because chronic stress over time reaps havoc on your body, but also your brain. And because I chose to talk about stress first, we got to go into how can you tell if stress is ruining your brain? And this whole podcast, I'm going to go into the five main problems that I see as the biggest interferes with your brain. And I'm going to go through them in terms of how you can assess if this might be an issue for you. And then I'm going to talk about the different herbs and nutrients and supplements and nootropics and all these different things that are out there on the market and what might be the most useful in certain situations. So we'll go through it. All right. So the stress. Let's let's get into stress. Stress is quite possibly the root of all evil, as I will call it. And it's quite possibly really where it's that tipping point where your health starts to decline is when you lose your ability to completely deal with stress. So when you're stressed, your hormone cortisol is going to be the big hormone causing trouble for you. And if you're just starting in your adventure in the stress, it's going to be that the cortisol is going to be elevated. And when you're stressed out, it stays elevated for some time. And then eventually you get a point where your body has taken the total amount of stress that it can deal with and it then starts to not know when to release cortisol or when to not have it released. So basically you're on a roller coaster, your body's just kind of puffing it out to the point where you get to the extreme stage where your adrenal glands, the glands responsible for releasing cortisol into your body, eventually just can't even produce cortisol at all, which is a serious end point where you don't want to get. And really, my whole goal in life for all of my patients is to prevent them from having end stage adrenal dysfunction. Most of us kind of hover in this land of adrenal imbalance, meaning we're stressed, 
We've had multiple traumas in life that have compounded and our bodies are confused as to when to release cortisol and when not to. And it's this fine balance in between cortisol and its counterpart, GABA, which is a neurotransmitter that actually calms us down. And a lot of times what will end up happening is the more stressed someone becomes over time, the harder it is for them to be able to calm themselves. And so heart palpitations, mind wandering, mind racing, insomnia, all of these things oftentimes are signs of an imbalance between cortisol and GABA, the neurotransmitter, for calming you. Now, if you look at your day and you look at when you have the most difficult times with concentration and focus and memory, this is going to give you a huge clue as to if cortisol is a big issue for you. And like I say in a lot of my podcasts, if you listen to me talk over and over again, I'm always talking about you got to get the data. You got to pay attention to what your body's doing. You've got to jot down in a journal or the notes in your phone, whatever it may be. It's really important to have that information for you day in, day out, tracking when you have issues because that is the best way to be able to connect the dots with your health. So cortisol naturally rises between 6 and 8 a.m. to wake us up, and then it slowly declines throughout the day with a more drastic drop, if you will, somewhere around the 2 to 4 p.m. time frame, and then it's going to start flatlining around 8, 10 p.m., and then it's going to start to slowly rise again because it's going to wake us up. So if you're starting to notice that you have some serious brain fog and concentration issues in the morning, so say you like wake up and you're like slogging through this really deep fog, it's possible that you're not producing enough cortisol to even get you out of bed. So your circadian rhythms are off. Now that's one thing. Maybe you're the type of person that your brain fog and concentration and memory kind of all go off the deep end around mid-morning, say 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. Now, that's when cortisol is starting to decline during the day. And depending on how stressed you are in the mornings, if you don't plan well what you're going to wear that day and so you're frazzled, you're running, you're grabbing the kids, you're trying to get out the door and your morning is just a crazy, chaotic routine, um, your cortisol is going to go higher in the morning and your blood sugar is going to go higher. And blood sugar is directly connected to cortisol release, especially if you're going to get a big crash after your cortisol goes up. So imagine if you're this type of person – Morning's chaos. You're trying to get everybody else ready to go in the morning. You are grabbing your coffee, so you're getting your caffeine to try to get your day started. You're anxious because you've got a big meeting at work. You can't be late, but everybody in your house is not cooperating. You only have had your coffee in the morning, so now your cortisol is going up, 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 up. Well, you get in your meeting. You don't need anything because maybe you're doing the presentation. And then by the time 10 o'clock goes around, you're like crashing. You're looking for more coffee. You're looking for a donut. You're looking for the candy dish in the office. This type of problem is going to set you up for a roller coaster for the rest of the day. And most likely if you have problems mid-morning, you're going to have problems mid-afternoon with blood sugar and cortisol. Because like I said before, when I start, first started talking about cortisol, 2 to 4 p.m., that's when the cortisol drops. So timing is a big deal to see if cortisol elevations and drops may be an issue, especially if you live the type of life where, where your cortisol might be going up and down all day long. So people who are in the first responder industry, so firefighters, police officers, um, ER nurses, staff, etc. If your day goes up and down like this and you're finding yourself with brain fog at certain times in the day, I'm going to highly recommend that one, you're working on making sure that you're fueled properly, good proteins, good fats, veggies, and not relying on junk food and caffeine to keep you going. I mean, most of us know that those things are quick fixes. But if you're listening to this podcast, my guess is that you're trying to figure it out and you're trying to figure out what the heck you can do in the meantime to get things balanced. 
So if cortisol is what's possibly ruling your day and ruining your brain, there's some ways to look at what's going on. And in particular, I really like to look at saliva cortisol because we only typically can get a blood draw in the morning for cortisol. And that's not good enough because the morning is only one point in terms of your whole day. With saliva cortisol, we can test before breakfast, before lunch, before dinner, and before bed and have four points at which we can see are your circadian rhythms normal? Is your cortisol higher in the morning? Does it taper off during the day and drop down at night? Now, if you have insomnia and chronic insomnia and a stressful job, chances are your cortisol is off. It's kind of cool to test it and, you know, just to confirm. And then also to know what direction should you head in? What kind of herbs, what kind of maybe amino acids, neurotransmitters should you be working on to try to help your body get its balance back, regain your circadian rhythm? ZRT Labs is a great lab with saliva kits. You can order them online yourself or you can find a naturopathic doctor or functional medicine doc in your area to help you with that. You can also, if you order them online, the company will help consult you through what your results mean and where to go from there. Now, another biggie for folks who might be thinking if cortisol is affecting their brain is to also look at your blood sugar. So fasting blood sugars can tell you a good sense of what's happening. And in the same respect, something called the hemoglobin A1C test, which is blood serum in particular, you want to be fasting for it. This can tell you what's happening over a three-month period with your blood sugar. I prefer this one. It's just a good, well-rounded essay, essay, not an essay, an assay of what is happening. So I really do like to look at that. If you're starting to notice that you're really gaining weight around the abdomen, you're becoming sensitive to carbs, like you look at carbs and you gain 10 pounds. Um, if you're one of those individuals, an insulin resistance score might be a really good measure of what's happening in terms of your body's response to carbohydrates. Because the higher the cortisol levels go for a longer period of time, the more that your blood sugar has been on a roller coaster as well. And chances are your body's becoming insulin resistant, meaning it's having difficulty processing your carbs. So uh, LabCorp in particular has a good insulin resistance score test that goes along with your lipoprotein fractionation study. Say that fast five times. That is your lipids. So looking at your fats and you can do a particle size. So that's what the fractionation study is. It's looking at the sizes of your cholesterol molecules. And they also do an insulin resistance score with that. And so it's looking at your total body metabolic processes. It's kind of cool. And that's through LabCorp. And if you wanted to look at it through Quest Labs, it's called Cardio IQ. And that does come with an add-on for insulin resistance scoring. So what do you do? You ask your doc if they can add those on. If your doc's not interested in doing that for you, you can actually even order these labs online as well these days. There's any time now labs or something of that nature. I'll put it in my podcast notes at drjkrausnd.com. There's my lab tests online. There's so many different companies who will run your labs at a fraction of the cost that you would run through insurance. So if there's anything that you want to know on your own, you can access it, which I think is pretty cool. Knowledge is power here. Knowing what's going on with your body is huge. So those are the different tests that I would be looking at to determine if cortisol is affecting your blood sugar, your brain, and if it is really causing your brain damage. So what do I do in terms of balancing cortisol? I like to use herbs to balance cortisol. And in particular, I like adaptogenic herbs, but I also like mushrooms as well. I'm not talking about mushrooms that cause you to trip. I'm talking about mushrooms such as cordyceps mushrooms and lion's mane mushrooms. Those are my two favorites. If someone's having trouble with keeping their cortisol in check, meaning the cortisol is on a roller coaster, or they have low cortisol and they're also suffering with fatigue that goes along with the brain fog and goes along with the difficulty concentrating, I really like cordyceps mushrooms. 
you can get a mushroom powder and put that into a smoothie. You can put it into a soup. I mix it into pretty much anything. Um, I like it. And so that gives me a boost for the day for energy. But I also like lion's mane. And if any of my patients ask me, like, what's my favorite go-to to to help with concentration, focus, and memory, it's lion's mane mushrooms. There's a company called OM Mushrooms, O-M Mushrooms, and they're all grown in the United States, actually in California, and they have capsules, but they also have powders, and I like the powder just because I'm really interested in being able to... I don't know. I just hate taking pills. Let's put it that way. But I'm interested in being able to mix in my 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 supplements into my foods, kind of spice mixes. And so I typically will use the Om Mushroom Lion's Mane to help, especially when I've got a lot going on at work. Things are getting chaotic because of my schedule. I will often make a smoothie or even make a soup and throw it into that as well. So if you are looking for herbs that are going to help with balancing your cortisol, if that's what you suspect is your issue, cordyceps mushrooms, especially if you've got some pretty good fatigue, lion's mane mushrooms, they can help repair your nerves. Um, They're great. It's just great for helping with the broken brain syndrome. So I often will combine both cordyceps and lion's mane mushrooms. And the dosage I use is the teaspoon that you will see on the package of the OM mushrooms bags. So ginkgo, St. John's wort, macuna, bacopa, rhodiola, and panax ginseng, otherwise known as American ginseng, are also other herbs that I would use to help with balancing brain function. But they all have different um, components to them. Rhodiola is a adaptogenic herb that can help you manage stress, but also help you with keeping cortisol in check, especially if you have sugar and salty cravings and you're trying to put a, the kibosh on those. Rhodiola, I recommend in the form of a tincture At this point, you can get rhodiola from Canada, which is a little bit more sustainably sourced. I don't use it as much as I used to because we are running out of it very quickly. It's been over-harvested, so something to think about in terms of sustainability with herbs. But it is an herb that can help if you're thinking your cortisol levels are on a roller coaster due to stress and you're not so into the idea of mushrooms. Um, Mountain rose herbals tinctures are my favorite. Panax ginseng is American ginseng. It also helps with boosting energy. So oftentimes if someone is struggling with the fatigue component along with the brain fog, inability to concentrate, memory issues, I will add Panax ginseng, so American ginseng, to cordyceps mushrooms and lion's mane to get a really big boost. Or I will have someone try the cordyceps mushrooms first, and if they're not seeing the energy boost from the cordyceps, then I'll have them switch to American ginseng and see if they get an energy boost there. So things to think about. Now, I also mentioned ginkgo, St. John's wort, macuna, and bacopa. These are different herbs to help with brain function. In particular, ginkgo helps with increasing circulation to the brain. Now, St. John's wort is increasing serotonin, dopamine, and noradrenaline release. So if you feel like cortisol is more low on you than high, so you're almost flatlining, you're super fatigued, your brain just, you can't concentrate, the fog is so dense that it seems like your nerves are just not firing like they should. And on top of that, you're feeling depressed because of all of it. St. John's wort's a good option. Now, Makuna and Bacopa, these guys are both really big dopamine boosters. I often will use Makuna when someone's starting to show signs of Parkinson's. Bacopa, I will use in folks who are depressed, lethargic, have brain fog, having difficulty getting through the day. So... There's my list of herbs, but more commonly, I like to use the mushrooms to just help with your general, why am I slogging through this brain fog kind of feeling. All right, that's enough about stress for now. Let's talk about the next biggie, 
hormone imbalances. So yes, cortisol is a stress hormone, but we have other hormones such as estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. These guys can wreak havoc on us. And in particular for ladies, drops in estrogen, and I'm talking about estradiol, the most active estrogen, can really cause some issues with sharp focus and concentration. So in this case, I will often have ladies tested in terms of hormones. There's multiple ways to test hormones. You can use saliva. You can use dried urine. You can use serum. So honestly, it all depends on what you're comfortable with, what you have access to. There's arguments as to whether the saliva testing is better than serum testing. Well, serum testing, your blood testing for your hormones is going to tell you what hormones you have available in that moment, whereas the saliva is going to tell you what you have on reserve. In a perfect world, I'd love to have both pictures of what the blood, so the the hormones right there and the ones that are on reserve are are doing in that moment, but money's involved in that and you know money doesn't grow trees so we can't do all of it but nevertheless having your hormones tested is a really good idea especially if you're perimenopausal meaning your periods are starting to get a little weirder you're starting to head towards 40 years of age and things just are changing emotionally maybe feeling a little more depressed maybe you're more anxious but you've never been anxious in your life and all of a sudden you just kind of have the switch turned on or you're starting to get more irritable and cranky and you're like what is going on along with difficulties with memory concentration etc so hormones always a big deal to look at and in particular looking at the progesterone levels as well progesterone is highly related to anger and irritability in ladies and so if you're starting to notice that you are getting grumpy, it's possible that your progesterone levels are dropping. Now, can't forget the guys in addition to the ladies in terms of testosterone. Testosterone levels too can have some issues in terms of if we're dropping on on testosterone, sometimes we will have trouble with focus and concentration too. So, don't forget your hormones when you're thinking about what could be messing with your concentration. And ladies in particular, if you're still getting your period, take a look and see if your levels of brain fog change at different times of the month for you. That could also clue you in as to what might be happening with your hormones. Now, another big category of issues in terms of concentration and brain fog goes to nutrition deficiencies. And by that I mean we have so many different types of diets and diet fads right now. A lot of people are missing out on key nutrients that they could be getting if they were eating a more balanced diet. Now, vegetarians and vegans naturally are going to be lower in vitamins B12 and B6. Now, iron's another biggie too. I cannot go without stating iron because sometimes memory concentration and brain fog can be related to anemia as well. But the other side of this is the more processed food you eat, the more you're going to have issues with nutrient balance in your body. Also, let's put it this way. Our soil is not as nutrient dense as it used to be. And if you're eating organic produce, but it's coming from let's say New Zealand, you're going to have less nutrient dense produce compared to if you're going to get something conventional. Yeah, it might have pesticides, but it might have more nutrition in it, which sounds really weird, but the mixed messages we're getting right now out in the universe is organic is always better. Yeah, if it came, you know, locally, but if it's coming from across the world, do you think you're going to get more nutrients out of that? Heck no. You can have a dead apple by the time it gets from New Zealand. There's going to be nothing in it anymore. And sometimes we have to think about this in terms of nutrient density versus pesticides, no pesticides. I'd rather have more nutrients, maybe a little pesticides than no nutrients whatsoever. I'd like to get nutrients out of my food if I can. But that's a debate for a whole nother podcast. So, the other biggie is folate. 
Folate is a huge nutrient, otherwise known as vitamin B9, and a lot of people aren't getting in enough folate. So this is your dark leafy greens. This is your more robust vegetables, if you will, the harder to digest ones. And that's going to lead us into our next part of the issue in terms of brain fog. But let's stick with the nutrients right now. Magnesium, alpha lipoic acid, coenzyme Q10, and L-carnitine, all nutrients that are crucial for helping your mitochondria, which are your factories in every single one of your cells, make energy. And so if your brain cells are not able to make energy, well, you're going to have issues with concentration, memory, and serious brain fog. Now, we also have some amino acids such as L-glutamine, phosphatidylcholine, and phosphatidylserine, which are key for proper brain function. Omega-3 fatty acids, also big brain function guys there. And a lot of folks aren't taking fish oils, or if you're opposed to taking fish oils, not getting enough flaxseed in, chia, pumpkin, etc. So something to think about. Now, there are tests out there that can help you to determine if you are deficient in any of these vitamins, minerals, amino acids, or fatty acids. The NutraEval by Genova, I always talk about them. That is a blood and urine test. You can also look at the organic acids testing by Great Plains Labs to determine if you are deficient in any of these vitamins, minerals, or nutrients. So taking a look at your diet, Overall, seeing what you're missing, seeing what you're lacking. For most of us, it's in the veggies department. And a lot of times it's looking at your source of your veggies, seeing if you can grow your own. That's going to be the ultimate way to get in a little bit more nutrients and making your own compost, which is going to give you even more nutrient-dense soil compared to what you can buy at the stores. Well, I take that back. There is some pretty cool designer uh, soil these days. But anyway, for the average individual that's just going to buy potting soil and throw it in their garden, sometimes it's better to do your own, make your own soil, compost. All right, jump off my public service announcement of composting. Now, another big issue that you could be having that can interfere with your brain function is if you're even able to get in your vitamins or nutrients or amino acids in the first place, meaning your gut health. How healthy is your gut? So how good is your digestion? But also what's happening with your gut microbiome, those bugs that live on your gut lining? A lot of us have overgrowth of yeast. Some of us have overgrowth of bacteria. Even molds in the gut can affect the gut-brain axis. So this is signaling between your gut and your brain. And if you've listened to any of my podcasts about mood or energy or things of that nature, you're always going to hear me saying that your gut's your first brain and your brain's your second brain. Your gut has more neurotransmitters than your brain, and the neurotransmitters are very similar. In fact, they're the same ones. So there you have it. Now, how would you test to see if your gut is abundant in bacteria, yeast, or molds, there are quite a few tests out on the market. In particular, you can see exactly what's in your colon by doing a test called Viome, V-I-O-M-E, Viome.com. You can check that out. Or if you're wanting to know what's going on in your intestines as a whole, I recommend doing an organic acids test, the oat test. Same one that I mentioned in terms of checking for your nutrient balance. And it's by Great Plains Labs. The NutriEval by Genova also will do the same thing to look and see if you have the metabolites of bacteria and yeast that could be interfering with your absorption of nutrients. The other biggie by Great Plains Labs is a test called the Mycotox, which could see if you have any molds overgrowing in your gut. Now, a lot of people might be thinking right now, like, how is it possible that mold would overgrow in your gut and mess with your brain function? Oh my goodness, you'd be surprised. And what I see a lot of times on lab tests is it's the molds that grow on our food. We are eating moldy food and we might not even know it. Maybe we're not cleaning our produce well enough. Maybe we're eating out too much and the places that we're eating at don't take care of those sorts of things. So this is a big deal. 
And if you live in a moldy, moist area like I do in the Pacific Northwest, now we also have other issues in terms of soil or even textiles, so carpets and curtains and other things that could have exposure to moisture and allow mold to grow. And now we're inhaling those spores and they're setting up shop in our guts, which sounds super crazy, but it's possible. So Michael Talks by Great Plains Labs can tell you what's going on in that department. Now, another biggie is parasites. And my favorite test to determine gut function and look to see if you have parasites is Dr. Data's CDSA. So it's a comprehensive stool analysis. And you have to give them three samples because you want to be thorough about looking for those parasites. But it's a great test to determine, is your gut function interfering with your brain function? So that gut-brain access Now, if you're hearing me spew all of these different things out and you're like, what the heck, I can't keep up with all the things you're saying, don't worry. Go over to drjkrausnd.com. I will have a thorough breakdown of all of the different tests in addition to the herbs I've mentioned today. And in fact, I created a blog post on this whole topic just so that you will have access to all of the info that I am giving you today. All right. So next thing. Infections, stealth pathogens. Could you have a lingering virus that your body can't clear that's affecting your brain function? So now this might seem a little in left field, but what I'm noticing more and more is that I've got a lot of patients who are coming into me with chronic fatigue, their brain's not working well, they can't focus, they're just struggling with keeping their mood up, their morale up. And I find that they have chronic mono. They might have chronic strep throat or chronic strep infections within the body. They might have parasites. They might have chronic hepatitis. There might be a herpes virus. There's all kinds of different herpes viruses out there, such as Coxsackie virus and Lyme. Lyme might be another stealth pathogen that I find that folks have. And all of these guys can invade your body and hijack your brain function. Lyme in particular has a affinity for the brain and the nerves and can really cause some decline in the brain. Unfortunately, a lot of folks have no idea they have these stealth pathogens. And with Lyme now being widespread across the United States, not just something that's endemic to the East Coast, This is something to really think about. And sadly enough, a lot of people have never even noticed that they might have had a tick bite or any bites, but they're coming up positive with Lyme. So these are big deals. And something that I highly recommend you ask your doc or you can go to independent labs online to get these tests done to determine if these are issues that might be affecting your brain function. So chronic mono infections, you can test that via the blood. Strep throat infections, you could, do a, you could do a throat swab. You could also take a look at this in terms of your colon, so in terms of your stool samples. So the CDSA, the doctor's data um, test I mentioned before to look at your gut-brain access and digestion function, you can also determine if there are chronic strep bugs that are living in your gut. And the reason I say chronic strep throat infections is is really that if you've had a lot of strep throat or like that's your Achilles heel, if you get sick, you're going to end up with a strep infection. Chances are it's in your gut too. And so that's why I'm mentioning if you're wondering like, what is this connection? Why is she talking about this? Parasites. That's also the doctor's data test because I've seen a lot of folks with autoimmune conditions such as Hashimoto's thyroiditis. One of the precursors to getting Hashimoto's was a chronic mono or something called blastocystis hominy, which is a parasite infection. So I'm kind of trying to help you prevent autoimmune stuff here too, but also autoimmune conditions can cause our brain fogs and issues with concentration and memory as well. So especially... I especially recommend folks to make sure that you've been evaluated for Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So meaning your antibodies to your thyroid, your antibodies to the enzyme that converts T4 to T3. So these are thyroid hormones have been tested. And and so I put a list in terms of what to have tested in that department. 
I still recommend folks to be screened for hepatitis C and B, even though hepatitis C now is a, a chronic screening. I'm still seeing docs not checking it. Herpes viruses, if you have chronic fatigue, your mind is just not working right, you can't concentrate, you're anxious, maybe you're getting different blisters or weird rashes or lesions, this is something to get checked out. So something to think about there. I highly recommend seeing a functional medicine doctor or a naturopathic doctor to get more into these specific tests because on your own it might get a little complicated to figure those guys out. Looking at autoimmune antibodies are always um, something to screen for. Now those tests aren't 100% accurate, but hey, you know, if something does come up, and when I say it's not 100% accurate, you might get false negatives but false positives can happen as well, but at least they'll give you an idea of do you have something going on? Is your body attacking itself and causing chronic fatigue, brain issues, things of that nature? So something to look at. All right. So I've gone through the most common problems and the different tests that you can look at to determine what might be your problems causing your concentration issues, your memory, or your brain fog. Now, I mentioned herbs. What I didn't mention are some of the different types of antioxidants, amino acids, things of that nature that can help with brain function. Now, in particular, there's something called PQQ, pyroloquinolone quinone. Try to say that one fast five times. It is an antioxidant that increases your energy production in your cells. And in particular, it's been found to be helpful with boosting brain function. I typically will have people start with the mushrooms such as lion's mane first or cordyceps first before going to PQQ. But PQQ can be really interesting for some folks. It, it's been considered a really good brain focusing and harnessing of brain energy antioxidant. There's a lot of companies out there that have PQQ supplements. I really like Designs for Health's PQQ, but there are other brands. And by the way, when I mention brands on this podcast, nobody's giving me any money to mention them. I'm not sponsored by them. I'm just giving you what I use in my office as just side knowledge. Now, an amino acid that might be helpful to increase brain function as you age, and if you're someone that doesn't eat a lot of fats in your diet, it's called phosphatidylserine or phosphatidylcholine. I really like phosphatidylserine. There's a product called PS150 by Designs for Health that I've found to be extremely helpful for those who just aren't into eating avocados and butter and, and higher fat foods, or maybe folks who are on a restricted diet because of cardiovascular issues or things of that nature, and their docs kind of scared them off of fat. Now, GABA. GABA is a neurotransmitter that we naturally make in our body, and it regulates erratic cortisol release. So remember when I was talking about, is stress causing your brain issues? GABA could be helpful to attenuate, so regulate how your cortisol is released. And oftentimes I will give folks GABA in capsule form, and there's a couple different companies. Thorne in particular has one called Pharma GABA. I will use that in addition to the lion's mane mushrooms and sometimes rhodiola to help with balance of cortisol release and help with sharpening your brain focus. So there you have it. L-theanine. This is amino acid that helps with balancing neurotransmitters in general. I often use it for calming. So if you start to notice that your brain function, focus, concentration is related to anxiety, L-theanine might be a good one for you. L-glutamine. This is amino acid that's used to help repair cells. And in particular, I like it for repairing the gut lining, but a lot of folks have found that it repairs nervous tissue as well. And so if you're starting to notice some cognitive decline as you get older and maybe you're having some tremors, things of that nature, by all means, go see a neurologist, but L-glutamine could be useful in this case. L-tyrosine is an amino acid that's used to help with dopamine production. I typically use tyrosine when someone has Parkinson-like symptoms. But if you find with neurotransmitter testing, which can be tested via the urine, 
using a company called Labrix. If you have low dopamine, a little L-tyrosine could be useful to help you with concentration and brain function. Now, another big thing out there right now are nootropics. Nootropics increase brain function, in particular, they're targeting something called brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is useful in our brains to help enhance our brain function, and we use it naturally, and it declines as we get older. Now, what I found with the nootropics is that they're not as reliable as working on what is the root cause of the brain issue. If we have decline in brain-derived neurotropic factor, it's usually due to stress. It might be due to poor diet. It might be due to just aging, right? So if we work on stress management, we work on improving our diet, I find that you don't necessarily need these nootropics. Nootropics are synthetic chemicals, if you will, and things like Adderall and Ritalin are nootropics. Now, I'm not prescribing those. I can't in my scope of practice. But things like paracetam, you might have heard of that one, or Nupept, um, Phenotropal. These are other ones, Provigil, otherwise known as Modaf- Modafinil. These are, as you can tell, I suck at pronouncing them. These are chemically based <sighs> brain-derived neurotrophic factor boosters, which, like I said before, can be useful if you find that nothing else is working for you. I would also be thinking in this case, if you need a brain-derived neurotrophic factor to help you, perhaps you've had a traumatic brain injury, perhaps there's been more damage to your brain than just life in general. So, You want to have a doc who's well-versed in using these if you're going to venture into the world of playing with these. But also you want to have looked at everything else we mentioned today, such as the gut-brain access, such as stress, such as diet, such as hormones. A lot of times I find if those are balanced out, you don't need the nootropics. So that's my stance on those. I have them all listed out and I will have them in my show notes at drjkrausnd.com, I'll also have a link to my blog post if you want to read out all of my details that kind of are outlined in this podcast. But to sum things up, if you're wondering why the heck you can't concentrate, why your brain is wandering, why it's like this huge fog that sets in and you can't seem to slog through it, it's best to start looking at how well you manage stress See if you have any hormone imbalances. Double check the nutrient deficiencies department. Make sure that you don't have any lingering infections or illnesses. Then go from there with trying certain herbs, changing up the diet a little bit, seeing if you have the nutrient deficiencies and correcting them before you go on to using some of the hard hitter nootropics and kind of go from there. I highly recommend if you go through this and you're having trouble sleuthing it out, find a naturopathic doctor or a functional medicine doc out there to help you to get through the details here and help you to find a solution because you don't have to deal with brain fog. You don't have to deal with the mind declining as you get older. You can prevent these things. There is hope for you. It just takes a little bit of sleuthing out to figure out what is the cause of these things. And so as always with my podcast, I'm highly recommending that you take your notes. You sleuth a little bit out during the day. See when you are most struggling with the brain fog or the memory or the concentration issues. And see if you can find some patterns. And then work back from there and Look at the appropriate testing if needed, and then you'll be able to at least have a place to start with to figure out from there, okay, if these things don't work, what's my next direction? And that's where us folks, the functional medicine docs and the naturopathic doctors are here for you. So 
I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. I hope my patients out there enjoyed my tidbits here in terms of what you were asking for in terms of information. And as always, if you guys are struggling with certain questions, you want to know how I treat someone in a certain case, or you want to know my advice, or you want to know what I've seen work, shoot me over an email at info at drjkrausnd.com. I'd love to answer questions. I'd love to have targeted information for you. So let me know what you're interested in. I'm here for you. You guys have a great day, whatever you're doing. Hey everybody, Dr. Janine Krause here. If you liked what you heard today, then head over to drjkrausnd.com to find my free resources and information to know when I post something new that's juicy that you might want to check out. Plus, head over to where you get your podcasts and like, subscribe, and write a review to help get the word out about me and help others at the same time to find me. It really does help and I really appreciate all of your reviews.